Over the course of my career in business, many, many things have happened that have sort of forced me to look at my life very differently and, and look at my value system. For me, burning out was the first red flag that I probably didn't recognize as, as, a, as a pivot point. I think when you first hire your first person, it is the scariest thing ever. Like having my first staff member, I hired her. She was somebody that I knew that was a big mistake as well. Welcome to Swift Coaches Academy, a podcast dedicated to bringing health and wellness professionals the uncensored truth behind what it really takes to succeed in the health industry with me, your host, Zania Wood. As an accredited exercise physiologist and business owner for almost a decade, I'm on a mission to transform the lives of ambitious health professionals like you who want more and are ready to take action to create incredible impact in your careers and unlock financial freedom in your business. So join me as I speak candidly with industry leaders about the struggles and successes from within the trenches through thought-provoking conversations. Welcome. Today, I'm super excited. We have a very long-time friend, previous client of mine, Loz Antonenko. Firstly, how are you going this morning? So good. Well, I just had to turn my treadmill off because... Normally I have these conversations walking on a treadmill and we discussed that it was interfering with the audio. So I would rather honor your time and turn it off. But normally I'm not used to seeing myself just here standing. So I do have a balance board and a wobble board. So if you see me rocking from side to side, I'm just... Uh, we can tell the ADHD exercise professionals coming out. Right, right. So I just wanted to be fully transparent during this conversation to the audience if you are watching this. Thank you. It's been great. I'm, I've been looking forward to this chat for ages. Oh, so good. And I feel like maybe we backtrack a little bit. So we met, I don't even know how many freaking years ago, like seven, maybe? 2000, um, 2017, we would have met. Okay. Yep. And so we met, I met you when I was like a little baby exercise professional. I remember you. Had baby giraffe. You were the baby giraffe. <laughs> And you had a you had a really fucked neck and shoulder and you were also competing in bodybuilding and you were dieting like crazy and had a bodybuilding coach and that's how I met obviously the bodybuilding scene and sort of digressing there. But you know, yeah. um, that was an incredible intro to the world of bodybuilding and um through you, which I super appreciate. And then with you, we've sort of, I guess, stayed in touch from a business perspective and just like friends, really. Um, yeah. But Lauren is, Lauren sounds weird to say, Loz, Lauren, you're in trouble. Um, <laughs> Loz, uh, I would say, is like your energizer, bunny, lycra, pink wearing, um, like crazy earring, uh, get the fuck unstuck mentor. Um, so do you want to dive in a little bit more about like all of that? And then, uh, today I think, you know, we spoke about talking about offers, entrepreneurship, scaling and exiting businesses, but let's go to like your story, how you got here. Yeah. And, um, thanks for the great intro. That was, that was really good. Yours was very accurate because you know me so well. <laughs> it's like, like we're loving, no half, half acidness, uh, mojo mentor. And I think I feel like I was almost the gateway drug for you to find all of these other people. It was like, we met and I'm like, okay, you need to go talk to this person. And I, I remember introducing um, people to you because you were so good. And I, I recall, even though you were like baby giraffe, like little, like you were, you know, younger back then, as we all were. Um, what I admired about you, Zania, was that you had this vision. And I remember you telling me when you were in clinic, you were like, I'm going to educate people. Like I want to coach coaches. I remember you telling me that and you were so clear on that and you had this obsession with Taylor Swift. And I remember when you came up with the Swift Movement Academy brand and we had we had like, we had, um, we had muscle tops and all sorts of things and trigger balls with branding and you were so profesh. And I was like, oh, look at you. Like you reminded me of myself. So, Aww. you know, it's, um, you know, it's been awesome to stay connected. But I think with my journey, so I've been, I mean, I'm, I'm probably the world's worst employee. Let's be fair. Um, Most business owners are. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I started my first business when I was 15. 
Um, I always had quite a solutions orientated mind. I got diagnosed with ADHD in the late nineties and, you know, it was very uncommon to be diagnosed with ADHD in the nineties, albeit being a girl being diagnosed. So I was quite marginalized and, um, I remember being medicated and, and like, I didn't really fit in very well, but I had my little drama friends and um, they kind of kept me going, I guess, creatively, but I started to notice problems that were happening. So for example, like at school, they, they made us all get the same school bags one year. So like you could have your own bag and then they made everybody get the standard issue school bag. And what was happening is kids were picking up other kids' school bags and taking them home. And so I was like, okay, this is a problem. We need to create identification tags. So I went and wrote to the principal with my dad's help, got permission to use the school logo and on Microsoft Word, because I was like all over computers by that stage, on Microsoft Word, I created a template and I created this business called Bag Tags. So I would, in my spare periods or like lunch breaks, um, I would go around to all, of, it, was, it was like a kindy, like a prep to year 12 college. So I'll go to every single classroom and I sold my bag tags for $2.00. I would get orders of all of the kids' names and then I would go home and meticulously enter individual names onto individual parts of the templates with the school logo. I would cut them out with a guillotine and I would put them all through my dad's laminator. I would punch a hole in it and get a zip tie and deliver it, deliver it back to them um, in five business days. And so I made like this, it's like, I don't know, have I ever told you this story? No, this is crazy. I love it. Well, so that was my first, so I, I even got an ABN. Like by the time when I was 16, I went and got an ABN. So I started that when I was 15 and like I was starting to make good money. I was like, oh, I'm going to go get an ABN. So registered an ABN. And then, you know, I uh, I would build computers for people. I had a really good eye for detail having ADD. So um, my dad was a quality assurance consultant. So really into like systematic stuff. So I noticed that he was writing a lot of reports. And so... I volunteered my services to people to help them with their resumes. I did some tutoring. I did like maths, English, geography, physics, like random brainiac. And then um, I then would go into organizations and help them with their systems and their processes. And I'm like, I'm like in high school at this point. Um, so when I, when I finished high school, I went to university uh, on a scholarship for IT, which a lot of people don't know about me because they see me as this bright and bubbly, like fitness person, but I actually yeah. have a really this pragmatic way of thinking. And it's, um, it's helped me a lot in business to be fair, but yeah, it's odd. Like I, I've kind of, I have worked like a regular job sort of like while I was at uni, but I really struggled. I, I found that like working in a team wasn't a problem, but wanting to be autonomous was really challenging because I had this desire to solve problems and I would watch problems continue to perpetuate in these systematic businesses. I'm like, this is stupid. Like what you're doing is stupid and it doesn't work. And I wanted to fix it, but I couldn't. So when I finished university, um, I got actually sick halfway through my university degree, which is a big part of the story as to why fitness found me. But um, halfway through university studies, I got diagnosed with a condition called ulcerative colitis. So it's very painful. It's a form of inflammatory bowel disease. Um, you bleed, you get ulcers. It's, it's shit, literally, figuratively also. Um, but um, after taking six months off, it kind of forced me to sort of revise what I wanted to do and... I ended up getting into a lot of sort of social science and behavioral stuff because uh, I didn't want to continue going to the campus in the city because I just, I couldn't, I couldn't actually physically do it. Like I was, I had chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia. So it was a first insight into like what poor health can look like. And I was experiencing that firsthand. So instead of getting a normal job upon graduation, I actually got accepted into the ACCC cadetship program. Um, so the Australian Consumer Commission. And then I also got a job offer through a lecturer writing feminist policy at the Office for Women as a government job. Um, but I turned both of those down and I decided to start my own proper business, like my first proper, proper business. Uh, so I did that with my dad and we opened up a, a mobility equipment and rehabilitation store. So, and people are like, that's random. I'm like, I know. So it once again, solutions orientated. It was like he was doing quality assurance work for a company in the industry. Uh, and we're like, well, there's nothing in Ipswich like this. And you want to find yourself a job. Um, so why don't we just go into business together? So my dad, technically very clever, um, engineering background, me, very multi-skilled. Um, I did everything from admin sales calls. I even designed all the marketing material because I had a, a degree that covered me for like graphic design. I actually built our computer system. Like I physically built our computers. 
um, super random. Learned, had to learn accounting, which was awful. Uh, but like <laughs> worked it out like myob for me at the time was just is it it was a dog's breakfast um but you know have found my way since and and that was nearly 18 years ago now that I did that so um over the course of my career in business um many many things have happened that have sort of I guess forced me to look at my life very differently and, and look at my value system, look at what, what it was that I was doing and how I was solving people's problems. Um, happy to talk about that if you want. Mm, I think, yeah, I mean, there's probably a bit to dive into. Maybe we'll, we'll come back to the value stuff because I definitely think that there's some importance in that and how that creates your business. Um, but if I can, I think something that might be valuable today is to talk about like, so obviously you created this mobility business. Firstly, probably just to clarify that's usually mobility aids. So like you're thinking wheelie walkers and other sort of OT related assistance devices, just so yeah. people know, you know, it's not, um, you know, trigger balls and, and things um, of that nature, but I do sell, I do, I do sell that too. Of course you do. <laughs> um, but I think what would be helpful today is to talk about, um, you know, thinking about going from like you created this business and then how to scale that from like you doing literally everything to then hiring people and then the exciting thing of you exiting and like selling your business, which like most businesses don't sell and like even fewer sell profitably. So um, why don't we just backtrack for a second? Like, yeah. When did you start thinking about scaling it? Was that before you started? Did you always have that in mind? And how did that develop? So no is the answer to all of those questions. When I started in business with my dad, I had no plan. I had no desire for the industry, but it was solving a problem. And I just assumed that it would be a family business that we would run and then we would sell. Um, I did things in the way that I tell people not to do things. Um, don't do what I did. I would always say that what I did was the poor way, but this is why coaching and consulting for me has been such a privilege to be able to help people not have to make the mistakes I did. Um, you can say that I've basically failed forward for nearly 20 years. Uh, so essentially I didn't go in with a mindset. I didn't even have a business plan. Danielle. I didn't have a business plan. We had quality systems that we didn't follow, but it was literally me buying myself a job. And for probably the first eight years of, of my business life, I was the everything um, mm. so I was doing all of the things I was making great money because we had really low overheads because we didn't have any staffing costs, but I was forced into growing up and having to put on my big girl business pants due to illness. I actually ended up burning out, um, and was hospitalized, uh, which is why I'm so passionate about helping business owners simplify their daily habits so that they can have more focus, performance and confidence. And that's what I do now. But for me, burning out was the first red flag that I probably didn't recognize as, as, a, as a pivot point. I actually burnt out three times. I was hospitalized two times. Um, the second time I was hospitalized was because my business relationship broke up with my father. My husband um, took his own life and I had some other things happen and I literally could not actually do my life. And mm -hmm. in dire circumstances was forced to find staff. It was, and it's crazy to say this, um, I have a TED talk that I'll be doing in August. And yes, I have one book. So I've, I've just, that's sort of coming through at the moment. But um, the premise of some of my talk is that my husband's suicide was the best thing that ever happened because it really actually forced me to open my eyes that things had to change. And if things were going the way that they were, that nothing was ever going to improve and I would never scale, I would never improve and I would never find my sense of purpose. Um, I was really caught up in the minutia of the day-to-day -day runnings of my business. And I couldn't see the wood for the trees that I could actually scale and I could actually make this business something that was sellable. So like there, there are, there are, there are strings of things on Reddit of me uh, from me or like not from me but of me like I would be in all of the Ipswich parades I'm, I'm based out on Ipswich so I do like all of the parades and I get dressed up in gear and I like ride a scooter backwards through town I get photos taken I was like the biggest media tart that ever existed in Ipswich and people know me because of the mobility store stuff so I developed a reputation uh, in a positive way but my business was completely personified by me and so when those three situations ensued in my life I kind of had to, I was forced to pivot, not, not proactively, but reactively. But as a consequence of that, 
I hired my first staff member and over the years I've actually worked out. Uh, I've had, I think I've had 19 different people run through my business in terms of staff. Um, I haven't physically worked in that business for about four years now. When all of the stuff happened with like my life imploding, I actually, that's where fitness found me. So this kind of took me in this other direction which is kind of what instigated me wanting to sell the business. So it's 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 not it's not as linear as most as I wish it was it could have been. And if I look back and I actually had an exit plan, it could have been a lot smoother and I probably I wouldn't have had to fuck up so much. But I think when you first hire your first person, it is the scariest thing ever. Um because you're like I'm handing this to someone else who isn't me. And I think when you can relinquish control to some degree of like micromanaging things and you can understand about automation, elimination, delegation, and you can see that you can actually replace yourself very easily with systems and processes. It becomes like, oh, duh. I can't believe I didn't do this like five years ago. It's one of those moments. But I think that just that, that fear of letting go is what holds a lot of people back from scaling. They go, I can't do that because nobody can do what I do. Like they're bullshit. They freaking can. And they already are in other businesses. And 100%. It's like other people are self-employed doing this. So you're not this special yes. snowflake. <laughs> yeah. And I think for me, um, like having my first staff member, I hired her. She was somebody that I knew that was a big mistake as well. Um, over the years, you know, I've, I've basically got managers in now. I have teams. Everything's delegated. Um, you know, I'm still overseeing stuff. Like it's not like I'm letting the business fly blind. But, you know, I guess my input is like, just making sure that we have a plan where we're on budget. It's just those bigger, just level, those higher level decision-making skills that I have that I think I didn't honor and value when I had them um, because I was so caught up in like, oh my God, I got to put out this fire or every single day, like in retail, especially there's a lot of fires and you're at the mercy of a market that changes dramatically with economic climate and, and consumer sentiment. So, you know, flash forward to now, um, so fitness kind of found me through all of that. I started going to a gym. Um, I hadn't really been to a gym before, but I started engaging in exercise as a way to cope and manage my stress and my grief. And that turned into me like meeting new people and talking about things I'd never talked about before, like eating healthy and being happy and, and things that my friendship group at the time, like that was never part of our culture. And, um, you know, I ended up doing some bodybuilding shows, which is when I met you. I developed an eating disorder. Uh, I've had a brain tumor, a hole in my heart, all of these things that I've had to manage while my business has been scaling. But in the background, because I've been putting these wheels in motion for the mobility business to kind of become its own thing, like we doubled and then we doubled and then we doubled. And so all of a sudden, like I didn't need to work anymore. And so I started studying and, and found this other path. So the decision to want to sell came up when those three things happened, like this idea that maybe I didn't need to do this business anymore. But I don't think I really took it seriously until about three years ago. So the decision to sell is is hard to make, um, but there's a lot that's involved in selling. You can't just go, oh, I'm going to sell a business and sell it the next day. It doesn't work like that. It's a, it's a going concern. It's an asset. And there's a lot of preparation involved. And I have to say, and we said this before we hopped on this recorded chat, but it's been such a steep learning curve, like exiting a business. It's been, and like, we haven't used a broker or anything. I literally cold called other organizations out there to be like, we got an offer from somebody and it was quite offensive, um, which is fine. You didn't have to take it, but I was like, fuck this. I'm going to go call around. And I just called around other organizations to touch and feel and see if they were interested in expanding into where we were, because we'd become quite profitable. Um, it's a booming market, the mobility space. We've got government funding, um, for a lot of the stuff, which is uh, very lucrative um, for, for people that want to be able to supply to that. But um, it was kind of a decision to go like, I'm seriously going to take this sale thing in my own hands. And it's turned out really well. So as a consequence, um, we're doing a deal now with another organization who really align with the values that you know I've had to find over that time. But it's also scary because the safety net of having that business, because I'm, I'm my identity is kind of like part of that now. You know, it's been a process of removing myself and that personification of that business from me, getting people involved that aren't me, and then taking that step out completely and like just pulling the nail out of the foot so that I can run in this other direction now. And um, for me, I needed proof of concept in my fitness and well-being business that it was going to work before I could make that that leap of faith and go, this is the thing now. 
So mm-hmm. it was like the decision was um, predicated on the fact that I had to be able to not only replace my income from the other business, but double it, which I have done now with my oh, other wow. So, And was that just like a personal thing for you that you wanted to be able yes. to do? Yeah. Yeah. And it was, it was for me proof of concept just because the fitness industry, I guess, I've come from a retail based industry where we're selling goods and services, sorry, goods primarily with some services attached, but primarily commoditized. So, you know, it's, 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 it's a price comparison game in retail, you know, like with the likes of big companies coming in, you know, even places like Bunnings and Kmart and Aldi, they also sell mobility equipment, which is scary because they don't back it up with support. But the problem is, is that when you're an older person or, you know, a person that's not really informed about product, they'll just see a shower chair and another shower chair, which can be completely different. One can have Australian standards, take 180 kilos and get parts and it's more expensive, but they'll see this other one and just think that it's exactly the same and it's really rubbish. And they'll see the price and go, well, why would I spend, you know, $50 more on this when I could buy this? And so it's quite scary because you're having to play this price game. Whereas in the service based industry, which is the fitness industry, which is a relationships and sales industry, it's about, you know, giving value. And so you don't need to pry the, play the price game because if what you do is you know, different and giving people a better sense of value and giving them the outcomes that they need, it's all in the sizzle, it's all in the sell, it's all in the offer. And so that translation of skills for me, honestly, Xenia, has been really challenging to navigate because I'm like, I've come from a space where people come there for a need and a goal and a thing and they walk out and they buy it and they're done. And you just remind them that it needs service every now and then this whole other space of selling service. It's like a lot of people don't know that they need the service that I have, you know, but it's up to me to help them unpack the fact that what they thought they needed probably isn't going to solve their problems. And this other solution that I have, which is far more comprehensive is going to give them the best value. And then structuring my laws life business, which you can see the logo behind me in accordance with that and creating separate offers to meet separate demographic and psychographic cohorts and that then leverages my time so it's been I still have a lot to learn and I'm always reading and doing personal development Um, but I tell you what having run a business for 18 years has helped me dramatically really succeed in the fitness industry Um, and it's been exciting because now I'm like I have an exit plan for Loz Life like I have like I already created that having learned from my mistakes like it's having succession planning Mm -hmm. in place when you enter a business with, so, cause you want to have the intention set at the beginning of your business that you can sell it, that it's worth something. Cause the statistics where I heard this the other night, like 80% of female business owners never get a chance to sell their business because they have to just wind it up. It's not sellable. That's bloody scary. I think I just want to touch on that. Cause you, you mentioned like in your eyes, it's so obvious that you would want to create a business to sell, but can you maybe just unpack why like I understand and but I want to hear from you as well like why you think creating a business even if you don't want to sell it or you know maybe when you turn 65 then you want to sell it or whatever it is right like why is it so important that um someone say who is a health professional or whatever why should they build a business to at least be sellable well a business is an asset right and people just treat their business as the job most people come into a business with the mindset, says, I don't want to work with somebody. And the conversation they have in their head is like, oh, I'm going to start a business and life is going to be great. And I'm going to have all this time and I'm going to have all this money and I'm going to have all this freedom and everything will be sweet and I'll love my life so much. And the reality is, is the conversation we should have is, I'm going to start a business. I'm going to help people, but it's going to be fucked because I'm never going to have any time for myself. I'm probably always going to be putting money in front of self-care Um, you know, it's going to be really hard for me to go on holidays. And that's, that's the business mindset that ends up occurring when people don't have the sales orientated, the sales, I guess the sales centric outcome at the end of it, because so many business people, and you probably see this people, especially if they're micro businesses, where it's just themselves, maybe one other person, like it's really labor intensive, especially in the beginning, you're creating this thing, unless you're an MLM business, which we won't talk about. Um, the reality is, is like, you're essentially just buying yourself a job and things to do. But when you start to think about your business as an asset, you start to think about your business as intellectual property, as something that's of a value, an asset should increase in value. If it's not increasing in value, it's a liability. Putting your money, your time, your sweat equity 
into something that you have zero desire to sell is like buying a 200 year old house that's nearly falling apart and deciding to spend $2 million to keep it alive. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, it's just a love, love, it's a love project. Are you doing this for love or can you do it for love, but also for an outcome that's going to help you in the future? And I think when you kind of switch that part of your brain over to like, this is a proper thing, it's worth something because my time, my money, my intellectual property, my ideas have a value. I think the problem is that people don't realize the value of those things. Straight up, as soon as I started this business, I'm going to trademark register. Mm. Not only did I register a business name, company, trademark straight away. I'm like intellectual property, word mark, device mark. Um, and I have other little trademarks registered as well. But the reality is it was like, it was treating it like a proper business from the beginning because of what I'd learned from the other thing. But I think for people, it's just that little change of mindset. Your your business is valuable, but it's got to be in a position where it can be sal- saleable. And in order for that to happen, you kind of have to learn how to take yourself out at some point, at some point, yeah. not now, but at some point. And I think planning to succeed is one of the biggest failures people have is they don't do that. It's just a thing. It's a hobby. It's a hobby. It's like, dude, like this is not a hobby. Like you're spending every waking minute thinking about this thing. This yeah. is an obsession. Yeah. But no, and that's okay. But then if it's an obsession, make it worth something. Mm. And then I think on that as well, you sort of touched on like the IP or the systems that you have in your business. I know so many um, health business owners who in particular are like, oh, well, I just do what I do. Or, you know, like even they're like, their systems are kind of just in their head. And whenever I try to like extract them from people and I'm like, cool, like if you're going to hire them, they're like, I have no systems. And that's like, well, if you're going to set your business up to succeed and you know that you want to at some point, not just have a job that you've built for yourself, but turn it into a business. Cause realistically the time, effort, energy, emotional investment is I don't believe worth it to just have a job for the rest of your life that you've bought yourself, which is a business. I think you could do so right. much better by just getting employee and just like sitting back and doing your doing your hours and clocking off. But if you, if you are going to go into business and entrepreneurship, I think it's like you said, that forward planning, planning to succeed. I love that. And then the systems behind that and going, cool, well, how do I create an initial consultation? What does that process look like? And when someone does have this injury or whatever, and that's why I also think niching down is important because you can't be like, cool, I'm going to service every single body with every single injury and every single, you know, chronic disease or, you know, whatever their journey is. It's like, you can't systemize 7,000 different options, but you can systemize a few. And so to be able to go, cool, what am I going to go into and how do I systemize at least some of my processes? If not, um, I guess the more, the better, not to say like everything has to be rigid, but like 80% of it is going to be the same. And then you have the 20% tweaks. And um, like I said before, I don't think the same as as business owners, I don't think our clients are special snowflakes, but they're like, oh, my injuries are so unique to me. It's like, well, we've seen so many before and we do similar things so like why the fuck have we written this stuff down and why yes. like it, just to get it out of your head and I think it also helps to articulate and helps you to learn and something that I um I noticed and I saw uh Jordan Shallow do from Prescript who um, yeah. I met years ago but he would just write for hours like all his processes and now he's got like books out on um you know biomechanics and things like that but I just saw everything that was in his head and he was trying to create these systems these processes from like years ago and to now be like really clear on what that is and to be able to have a step-by-step plan and something that clients then feel confident investing into because there's a guaranteed outcome it's not just oh yeah I can help you with your shoulder pay me a hundred bucks per week and we'll see how we go yeah and it's more like I think I can help you with this thing and I I love that you've said that because guarantees are really important and whatever your guarantee looks like doesn't matter everybody can have a slightly different guarantee but the proof is in your case studies and if you've got cohorts of clients because you've got your niche right that are getting these results it's pretty easy to create a process around that and educate a team of people to be able to help you and it it does come down to training and having those 
clear procedures. Clearly there are nuances of clients and you're right. Like people seem to think they're these snowflakes and like nobody has your injury. I'm like, love, I've like seen four of you this week. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like my, my people are like at the moment, um, women that run businesses who are peri or in the throes of menopause, perimenopausal or, or, or like very menopausal, um, whose relationships are breaking down and they're at a um, me Jesus moment where they're like, I, I'm having a midlife crisis, but I don't know what that looks like, but I'm sick and tired of looking at myself in the mirror every day and hating on it because my business is now suffering because I'm not looking after me. That's literally the story of my business. What well, one part of my business, one part of my business, but it's just knowing that like, I know how to deal with those people. I have a network of other professionals that I refer them out to. We get blood work done. They go speak to them. In the meantime, I'm working on their mindset, their breathing, all of the things that they're doing in their daily routine. And surely, but you know, certainly things start to change. And in 12 weeks time, when they look back, they're like, holy crap. Like, how did I do that? I'm like, well, it's just a process, right? But it's mm. helping people pull that apart in a way that makes sense to them because you've done it so many times. And, you know, I have other clients, though, that meet other demographic, you know, needs, um, you know, especially when it comes to NDIS. But, you know, it's once again, it's understanding how all that works mechanically and being able to train other people up. So, like, I'm in the process now of, of putting a course together for personal trainers. It's been on the back burner though. I actually created this course a little while ago, but I haven't launched it because I've got a book coming out and I've been selling this other business. So that's been a priority. And yes, you can't have all the balls in the once in the air at once. You cannot, you cannot. You're going to expect some to drop. For me, that's dropped. That's okay though. Um, because, you know, even though I haven't even scaled that part of my business yet, I've still managed to not only replace my income, but double it because of the other income streams in my business that I've had. So I think... You know, all of those things matter and not just, you know, either focus on just one thing or have a really clear and defined product and offer that focuses on the other things. And I'm, I'm all of the um, belief that you should have multiple streams of income within your own business. Yeah, totally. And I think that's the thing that um, like effectively recession proofs you, right? Like if you just have one yes. product or one service or you only have one item, like when the market changes or when, you know, you want to change it, it's, it's just so hard. And I think without realizing it before, I really knew about like multiple income streams and all this sort of stuff. I, I kind of did it because I was just like, oh, I want to help coaches now. And, you know, I'd been doing that for free for years and just, you know, having conversations and putting things together. And then I was like, you know what, like I've been having far too many coffee dates. I'm sure that this right. can be, this can be like, this is, there's obviously proof of, of concept because people were asking for advice and, and getting that. And then to create something where it's like, you know what, I can step back from my business or I don't have to have every single part of my business be one-to-one face-to-face. And then if I'm on holidays, I don't make money. If I'm, you know, it's, the, the cool thing is, is like now with the clients that we have in our Biz Academy program, um, two of them just went on holidays and one of them was like, yeah, I made a thousand dollars a week for four weeks, like in Vietnam, just living my life, didn't pick up my laptop once. And I was like, how fucking cool. And that's that, that person's first hire. Like, this is not, I'm not talking about like these big, huge businesses. These are like sole traders, solopreneurs, and another chick's like, oh my God, like I've got online programming. And so I'm going to make $300 while I'm in Europe sipping margaritas. And I'm like, that's, that's fucking cool. Right. And I'm not yes. here to sell, like, let's, you know, not add value or impact and just go sip margaritas on the beach for the rest of your life. I think, you know, that gets old. Well, I quick. can help, I can help those people when they start getting really fat then. <laughs> Then, the, then I can help them. <laughs> but I do think like it's it's cool for a while and you, you definitely want to, the, uh, the theme is like, oh, I want an online business or I want something that's scalable or I don't want to be face-to-face -face forever. And yeah. it's going, how can we set that up sooner rather than later so that you have the option to exit your business, sell your business or scale it or, you know, not have to be like just putting in work and then getting to a point of, burnout or whatever that looks like for them where they're like fuck I'm just done like I think part of yes. the reason that I do the biz academy is because I've seen so many fucking good health professionals just leave the industry because they don't know how to run a business and then they just get overwhelmed with like oh I'm really good at like one-to-one face-to-face but 
you know, they're nervous of charging more and then they don't know how to create anything that's systemized. And so they're just doing all this extra work for themselves and they just got two jobs rather than one. <laughs> and it's time for money, right? And, and yeah. the, one of the best books that I ever read was a book by a guy called Alan Weiss. So Alan Weiss is a consultant in the States. He has like a whole series of books. I'm reading another book at the moment called Million Dollar Speaker because I'm moving into professional speaking now. Um, and I just really want to refine my craft. But he has um, one about value-based coaching, value-based consulting. And he talks about doing proposals for people and giving value propositions and giving them three options. And, you know, I love that as a concept because it's all about the outcome that the people are going to produce. And so, you know, I guess if we apply that to something like fitness professionals, it's it's taking away that exchange of time for money. And sure, like exchange time for money sometimes if you want to, but you yeah. don't have to. There's so many other ways that you can add massive value to people. And when you give people, like I'm all for hybrid coaching, right? Okay. I love face-to-face. -face. Yeah, I love face-to-face. -face. I literally have a gym 200 meters from my front door. Like legit, it's super convenient. When I do face-to-face -face coaching though, I'm very specific about who I will work with. I love working with my NDIS clients because of my history with people with disabilities and, and people who are older. I just love working with people like that because they always put the effort in. They are the people that will show up and do the work and they will never bitch about how freaking busy they are. Um, but I also have higher ticket clients who, you know, I basically am like a, a consultant, a life consultant for them where they're on a retainer with me and they get access to me whenever they need it. But a lot of the time it's through resources, it's through conversation. I do voice messages and look, then they're, they're low, um, what would be the word? like they're, they're soft touch a lot of the time. Like they're mm -hmm. there for big decision-making things that they need in their life. And I'm the person in their corner and they're basically paying for what's in my head. Cause they're like, I have this thing. I had a client freaking FaceTime me from Woolworths. You told me this and then you were like, let me just help you. Yeah. And so I was like, so, so like literally like I was like, well, next week for our catch up, like we have a face to face. She's not far. I said, well, how about I just meet you up there? And, you know, I'll take you to Cole. So I videoed it. So I got content out of it, which was funny. Um, it was a bit shit, the content, because Cole's is loud. But it was like, you know, like I just went through her normal shop and I helped her make some more informed decisions. But that's me getting to choose who I want to work with. Whereas, you know, with the other parts of my business, um, so I have like a weight loss. So I have weight loss, fabulous and boss loss. They're the three, they're the three packages that I have, right? Three I love that. solutions. Weight loss, um, you know, I have coaches. I haven't really been involved in weight loss for a long time. I check in with my coaches, but I don't check in with my clients because I've been able to train, you know, teams of, of people to be able to run that for me. And it's, you know, it's low barriers to entry. It's a really low price point. It's volume. It's getting people, you know, a solution, but it's an ascension model. So as part of weight loss, what will happen is clients will come through that. And they'll get some really great results and they'll be like, oh my God, for the first time in my life, now I want to exercise because I feel really good and I've lost some weight and my body composition's changed because I now am looking after myself with my nutrition. What does exercise look like for me? I'm like, great question. Here's another solution. Mm -hmm. And so when I train up my, my new team, they'll be able to manage all that for me. Um, so I'm still quite limited in that. But then what will happen is I'll attract people at top of funnel as well into the boss laws stuff, which is where I'm working with them one-on-one. -on -one. But a lot of it is that hybrid stuff. So there's an element of face-to-face. -face. It's normally once a month. Um, and then there's, you know, the stuff that goes on in between. And I love that because I can go away. Um, I'm still giving them value, but they're also very invested as well. So I want to give them value. And I don't yeah. need as many clients because, you know, they are so invested. So it's like at the bottom of the end, I have a, a business that can take on lots of clients where I'm not involved. And at the high end, I have high ticket clients who I only need a few of. And I feel great. I feel like I'm giving all of the value I can across three different income streams, three different value systems. And my clients love it because they get to have a touch of the business owner and they get involved in the culture that I provide, which is, you know, being a mojo mentor. It's about living life unstoppably. That's not a word, but I just made it up on the spot. And the reality is, is that people will love you for you as the coach that you are, but you've got to foster that culture within your team. And if you can find people that are like you, hold on to them. If you have staff members and team members that don't align with that, it's really hard to mm. let them go. Um, but also you've got to remember like it's, it's, it's 
for the business's sake and you want to be able to sell it in the end. And it's not just about who you hire, but it's about who you fire, unfortunately. I mean, that's a whole other conversation because I know recently. <laughs> recently I went through it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm happy to talk about it. Um, yeah. But yeah, it was, yeah, it's just like for the for the culture of the team long term, it's like I can't, I can't let something that big of a deal go and then yeah. still, and then it's like, well, does that person get special treatment because they got to, you know, be against, be above the rules. And then like, what does that say to the rest of my team in terms of upholding my integrity and going, you know what, like if I'm, if I'm saying this is the rule and then someone breaks the rule, that's like a, a literal fireable offense. It's like, then I need to, put my big girl pants on and like make that executive decision and be like, you know what? It sucks in the short term. And like, doesn't mean that they're not great at what they do, but it's like, that's not the culture that I want to create. And I think that that would, that would fester and that would, you know, one, one bad apple sours the whole bunch. Right. Exactly. And it's, it's that knowing, and this is, but because you've got this mindset and this vision and this idea and this intellectual property and this asset that's a going concern, and you're treating your business like that, these are the decisions that occur as a consequence. Because if you weren't thinking like that, Xenia, you'd be like, oh, yeah, and you just let it slip. And these are the biggest things that we can learn about ourselves and our businesses that when we do take it seriously, we are forced to make these difficult decisions. And it's at that border of challenge and support when we make the most personal growth and professional growth. And in that situation, you have the support of a team, you have support of other people, but also there is a challenge that is ensuing and you've got to, you've got to make that decision to take the challenge on and deal with it in a way that's going to be best for your vision. And, you know, it's a shame when that happens, but you know, you learn a lot about yourself as well through that process as a, as a business person, because you're going to have to do it again, probably at some point. Yeah. I've had to do it mul- I've had to do it multiple times. Um, I've had a lot of situations where it's organically just worked out because you just engineer it that way without being the big bad wolf. But there are times when you have to have those challenging conversations. And when you reflect on those moments in two years' time, you'd be like, fuck, that was really brave and courageous of me to do that. But God, I'm so glad I did. Mm. Yeah. And I think that probably perfectly ties back into like the values piece that we're starting talking about at the start because um my two biggest values are growth and courage so you know like for me to then go against that and go I'm gonna take the easy road and and not do the courageous thing and sort of dig my head in the sand or whatever it's like well that doesn't align with what I have said I value in life and so does that you know can I can I sleep at night really and and feel great about that decision and feel like I'm supporting my whole team and even that person right like they they pro- he actually knew that you know it was time to go and it wasn't working and so I think mm. that's what sort of prompted this um and so you know it's not like that person's a bad person and um or anything like that it's literally just like okay well clearly this isn't working and obviously we need to part ways and have yeah. a great life you know like it's okay and people evolve, right? Like, and people evolve, businesses evolve as well. And I think that the expectation that everything's going to be the same all the time and hunky-dory and dandy and rainbows and butterflies and all the shit that we talk about that's fantasy, the reality is, is there going to be days when people don't gel anymore. Their life circumstances might have changed. Their values might have changed. And when you've got that misalignment with of values with actions, if they're saying the shit but then doing some other stuff, that's, you know, normally a big red flag that, you know, maybe something's going on. And if you can't work through it with a staff member, I mean, I've had staff members that have had mental breakdowns and, you know, I've recognized that things are not going well. Mm. They haven't seen it, but I'm being, being able to unpack that with somebody about, is this the best fit for you? Yeah. It's not, it's not a good fit for me, but it's almost like bringing it back to them and, and, when you can see it through the eyes of the of the the the, the worker, the team member, sometimes as well, it's about bringing them to the realization that maybe this isn't the right fit. Maybe they can move in their own direction, and you know, a good leader will help people continue to to develop. Um, and you know, this could be a really great opportunity for that particular person that you speak of to go find their own way doing a thing differently. Yeah. You know, and that's okay as well. It doesn't make them a bad person. It just means they're not a great fit. And, you know, it teaches you a lot about human behavior, human relationships. Um, I know with my, my values, one of my biggest values is um, 
personal development through conscious connection. So, you know, I remember going through this whole process of writing all these down, but, you know, basically I grow by consciously connecting with people who I know are going to be a great influence on my life. So Mm -hmm. I, um, I model off a lot of people. So for instance, like um, the decision to become a professional speaker, I, I seeded that easy six years ago. Uh, when I started having this story to tell and I was telling the story and people were like, holy crap. And I remember like over the years, I've just been doing this and doing that and doing that and doing that. And then surrounding myself with these people and this circle of influence has continued to evolve. And I made it a decision um, at the end of last year that I would join the Professional Speakers Association, Professional Speakers Australia. I wrote it on, a, I wrote, literally wrote it on a whiteboard. I only scrubbed it off yesterday. Um, I said, join the PSA. So to join the PSA at the time, you had to be earning a certain amount of money from speaking. And I was like, okay, well, that's my goal is is to get to that so that I can join the PSA. And it was funny, I was at an event a couple of months ago and I was talking to two speakers who I'd met previously, one I'd spoken with at an event. And she actually said to me at that event, she's a professional speaker, she's done it for 20 years. She said, if you are not a speaker, she heard me speak, she goes, if you are not a professional speaker, you need to be because you are amazing. Here's some tips though, maybe get some more audience engagement. I'm like, duly noted. Um... And so I saw her sitting next to someone else that I'd met recently and I told them about my goal to join the PSA. And they're like, oh, you know, they've just opened it up an associate membership. I'm like, what's that? They're like, you, you, you just, anyone can join. You don't have to be hitting the professional level. I'm like, what? Since when? They're like, oh, just recently. So like literally I'm there and I signed up to the PSA. And, um, but now I've realized that I actually have hit professional level. Congrats. Thank you. I actually went back through my books and I'm like, you know, I've gone and done an audit of like where all my incomes come from. And I'm like, oh my God, like I actually am a professional level speaker at this point. So yeah, I'm going to go put in my application. I'll do it. I'll do it um, at the end of the financial year. But yeah, it was like, I just manifested that. Right. But it's because of who I, it's because of who I surrounded myself with. Mm. And, you know, I share that because who you hang around matters. And if you've got like a bad egg, you know, a bad apple in your team, as you said, a confessor and it influences everybody else. But for you as a business owner as well, I think it's really important for people to realize that it can be quite isolating sometimes business ownership. Mm. You do have to make that effort to get out and meet people. It's never about what you know. In the end, you can do all the study, you can do all the degrees, you can do a PhD, blah, 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 and know all the things. But if you don't have the right people in your life to be able to lead you and help you and inspire you and connect you with more people, like, what's actually the point of any of that and I think that's so right. huge I feel like that's not even talked about right and I feel like you were definitely like an early an early mentor or sort of connector at least for me in terms of that and you know picking up these other business owners along the way and like putting them in my pocket and being like oh yeah you yeah can come with me and, and whatever I think that's so under under talked about undervalued and just to have those people who you can just lean on when you just need someone to fucking talk to or run an idea by, but also to connect you professionally and and be able to create things together and to collaborate instead of competing with other businesses. I feel like we could bloody ramble all day on this, but I'm going to, I'm going to have to wrap up. Otherwise we will literally be here till tomorrow. Um, But one thing I I do want to make sure is that people know where they can learn more about you. And um, the other thing that I ask our guests to uh, bring to the table is one action item, because obviously I'm all about taking action and and making moves, not just listening to podcasts and going, oh, that's cool, but actually making a change in their life. So for you, uh, one action item, and then how can people continue to absorb more of laws? I want to start with knowledge acquisition is the worst case of entrepreneurial procrastination, right? It's the worst thing you can do is just knowledge acquisition, knowledge acquisition. If you are an entrepreneur, just acquiring knowledge is just you procrastinating. The biggest thing you can do, and I love that you talk about taking action, is to create a vision board. For me, whether it's um, digital or physical, being really clear about what your vision is. It doesn't have to be like a 50-year plan. It can be a 12-month. 12-month is great because calendar year, financial year, whatever you want, 
but creating a story for yourself about what it looks, feels, tastes, and smells like when you achieve the things that you want. Because if you aren't even fucking clear on what that looks like, how on earth can you reverse engineer the steps that it takes to get there? I will tell you as a fact, I have a vision board in my room. I update it normally on the first week of January. This year I forgot. And in February, I realized that like, I'm like, oh, I'm really, really stuck, blah, blah, blah. And I mentioned it to my friend. She's like, bitch, have you done your vision board? I'm like, nope. And so literally I just did it that, that afternoon. Since I did that and I did it late, I did it in February, I have achieved 85% of the things on that vision board and it hasn't even hit the end of June yet. The power of that board is like, I just put all of these pictures from the internet. I wrote down words. I'm like, woman speaking on stage in front of crowd. Like it sounds really stupid. I found pictures. You can use AI to make them now, but just finding them old school, cut them out, stick them up. It's right at the end of my bed on the wall. It's the first thing I see when I wake up, the last thing I see when I go to bed. That as just a thing to do is so much more powerful than you can give it credit for. Mm. Looking at your goals every single day. Yeah. Gives you something to aim for. And it's not even just the goals and affirmations and saying a thing. It's you physically seeing it. And being reminded, even subconsciously, that that's something that you're aiming for. The power in that is unbelievable. I know it sounds a bit woo-woo because I'm very evidence-based, but if you don't have a vision, how on earth can you reverse engineer the steps? So have a vision, reverse engineer the steps, and what's the one thing you can do literally straight after listening to this conversation with Xenia and Loz that takes you one little tiny step close to that? Because it's um, James Clear, 1% better every day. Mm. 365% a year. 100%. So um, that would be my, my tip um, and where people can find me. So I'm actually just about to launch a book. Um, I have an amazing new book coming out. It's called Get the Fuck Unstuck. That is the title of my book on the back of my phone. Uh, it's coming out on the 1st of July. So you may or may not be listening to this before or after that. Maybe I'm coming to you from the past or the future. That's okay. Um, but uh, I'm having a massive rebrand. So you can head over to loslife.com. There is no .au because I am international, babes. Um, the loslife.com. Um, also, lozantonenko.com is my speaker site for speaking opportunities. I love speaking. I have a lot of awesome topics and some of them go deep, but I use it with senses of humor. And life's always about doing it with your full ass, not your half ass. So I have little squishy stress balls in the shapes of butts. Oh my God, that's so good. <laughs> It's so good. Um, but um, yeah, you can find me anywhere on social. So it's um, at Loz Antonenko everywhere. And we've got your name. We'll have your name, how we spell it in the yeah. thing. So they'll be able to figure it out. Yeah, yeah, you'll be able to figure it out. And if you just type in L-O-Z-A-N-T-O-N, if you can't spell the rest, Loz Anton, the rest will follow. Uh, <laughs> and it'll be a bright yellow background with a weird picture of me on it. <laughs> and people are like, did you, did you Photoshop that? Like, That's legit my face. I, <laughs> he is doing this as a it. kid like moving your mouth around and having yeah, yeah love it yeah all right yeah, cool yeah. i'm gonna i'm gonna call that a wrap and um i will talk to you soon about um business stuff off of offline <laughs> offline off the line it's been so good to chat thank you so much Zenia. and oh, um, i hope everybody enjoys this chat cool see you later ciao ciao just a quick reminder before you go, that link is waiting for you in the show notes. If you are a health coach who is in business looking to grow or scale, we have options for both. And I am super excited to be working with a few individuals who are ready to take their business to the next level. If that sounds like you, chuck down and have a look at the show notes and you can apply through there and I will talk to you one-on-one -on -one and we can figure out if this is right for you. I cannot wait to chat. I have a tiny favor to ask of you, and that is to just hit that subscribe button if you have not done it yet. If you've made it this far, then I hope that this has been valuable for you and for us to get more incredible guests in front of your earlobes and faces if you're watching us on YouTube, then please do that now. And if you have any feedback or suggestions for me or something that was a golden nugget that really stood out to you in this episode, I would absolutely love if you flicked me a message over on Instagram at Xenia Wood Official. Until next episode and in whatever you do, move swiftly.